I've been watching the climbing world championships over the last few days, and there's a few things that I've seen that I wanted to talk about relative to the climbing walls themselves and the way that the route setting is being handled. Not so much about the setting itself, but the relationship of the design of the climbing walls and how it's being used. Different things that I see as someone who, I mean, back in the early 2000s, my first job at the end of college and then right after college, was not as a professional climber. I wasn't quite at that level, but I was competing in nationals and did okay. But I was a climbing wall designer. That was my very first job, my first real job outside of a restaurant, basically. And I did that for almost four years and I loved it. But when I went back for architecture, um, I started developing entire buildings. So now I work on climbing gym design, meaning the building and all the programming and stuff and the climbing walls. and. Different times, uh, different projects, we work with different climbing wall vendors in different ways. In some cases over the last 10 or 15 years, we've just said, hey, here's like directionally what we're looking for, like steep wall here, less steep wall over there. Um, but in other cases, we actually really designed the whole thing. In the last few projects I did with Brooklyn Boulders, Ty Foos and I, who were working there together, really designed um, what is now the DC bouldering project and what was the second Chicago Brooklyn boulders, which is now closed, unfortunately. But jumping into the climbing walls, which is really what we're here to talk about, I wanted to just point out a few things. And I'm gonna talk about both the root climbing wall um, as well as the bouldering wall. And I'm gonna start with the boulder. And one of the things that I noticed instantly in the broadcast was, you know, number one, it it seemed to me like it was just a broadcast that I could see being very popular. The commentary from Matt Groom and Shauna Coxey was distinctly excellent. And, you know, Shauna has such a great way of describing just what's going on as, you know, an elite athlete in her in her own right. You know, she was really able to articulate things in a way that just not everybody can. And so, you know, the two of them I found just completely engaging and really everything from, you know, root reading roots to, uh, you know, the climbing itself and the movement, the subtlety of sequencing and whatnot. But again, getting to the, the climbing itself, because the reason I mentioned that as a as a sort of great part of the broadcast was because I also thought the climbing itself was a was really interesting. It seemed a little different to me than the uh, normal World Cup setting. It was a little bit less jumpy, I guess, although I would say that um, there definitely were some problems like the slab on the left that, you know, wasn't impossible for shorter people, but definitely there's a few moves that, you know, people like I Mori and Brooke Rabbitu had like distinctly uh, more difficult times working out and you know whether or not that's good or not i don't you know i'm not actually going to judge that but it was clear that that was a thing that they had to be extra precise with their hip placement and things like that to even be able to make certain spans you know whether or not that's a good thing uh you know we can continue to discuss as a, as a community but you know one of the first things for the bouldering wall here i thought it was so cool the way that they had these features uh, marked out. And so a couple things that I'm pointing out, you know, number one, uh, one of the first things I look at is the coloring of the wall relative to the breaks and angles. And so if we just look at this one panel here, this zero degree, so meaning vertical, what's kind of interesting is that if you trace the bottom edge, this is the only part that isn't a very straight line. This is a bump out, so basically this, vertical uh, zero panel is coming towards us and that allows it to have a bit of an indentation um you know so that it, it they keep calling this a slab they're also marking it as vertical here you know so it, it just gives this one end the sort of slab end as they refer to it a little bit more geometry and specifically it creates an arete right here that you'll see in in a second um, but one of the things that I do see a lot, and it isn't just in this, it's in really almost every climbing gym I look at, is the coloration. And so in this case, the coloration doesn't necessarily follow the angle breaks. And I'm just sort of highlighting a few of the, the angle, sorry, a few of the color edges that do not meet the edges of 
uh, the angle breaks, which I'll mark those in. So the pink versus the blue, basically. And you'll see how, you know, sort of what this starts to do. Um, there's actually another one over here. And, you know, one of the things that's sort of interesting is that you start to see how, you know, the volumes or these sort of larger holds are spanning across the colors. You know, this one as well. Basically, it's going across the paint line, not an angle break, because these are huge volumes. These are huge holds. And so they really can't turn corners unless they're designed for that. And, you know, it has to be a very specific way of dealing with uh, like an angle change if you're putting holds that wrap a corner or something. It just seems too complicated. So these are uh, color changes that are not related to angle changes. You know, again, from a from my point of view as someone who makes climbing walls, is this wrong? There's no right or wrong about any of this. But, you know, is it my preference? Not really. I, I look at things um, a bit differently and I'm going to show you a couple examples of what I mean right now. There's different reasons why we would use coloration that doesn't match changes in geometry. It might be, you know, for in this case, survival potentially. In this case, this is, we call this dazzle painting. And this is basically linked back to when ships and submarines were using periscopes. And so the, the dazzle painting, meaning painting that intentionally is not following changes in angle really helps to create, you know, the idea was that it's, it's not, you're not sure which direction the ship is going. And so if you're trying to like shoot a torpedo at it, you know, which direction do you shoot it basically? And that's at least my understanding as a not Navy guy, but as someone who's looked at this stuff, you know, the dazzle painting is one example of us taking something that happens in nature and sort of repurposing it. And other places that we can see this, um, this is a funny one where these horses are wearing these, you know, buzz off, uh, you know, capes basically to keep horse flies off of them because it's a real problem. And what they, the scientists were discovering is that this sort of patterning actually helps keep flies off of them. I think it creates confusion. And the same thing with uh, the, the Formula One car on the right. Some of these patterns are specifically designed to mess with the sensors of digital cameras so that, you know, a rival team doesn't understand what's going on with your car. They can't see the nuance from like far away with a super telephoto lens. So my point is, is that in these examples, really all three of these, there's a very clear intent as to what it is that's going on and why it is that the painting on the surface does not necessarily match the geometry that you're looking at. One project of mine that also follows a similar logic was the, originally it was called Brooklyn Boulders DC or Eckington now bouldering project DC. And these are some of my early sketches. These are from back, you know, three years ago, uh, 420 early sketches. I don't do a lot of sketches like this with watercolor, but I think my daughter was watercoloring. So, you know, I put color on the surfaces. And what you start to see here is that even in these very early sketches, what I'm studying, at least in my mind, is the relationship between flat surfaces, meaning these sort of larger ones, and lofted or ruled or hyperbolic surfaces that have iso curves, as we call it, just to like really get in the nerd weeds here for the geometry folks. And the point is, is that there's ways to break down a ruled surface or a hyperbolic surface, which is a has a geometric definition to it, just like a sphere does, um, or a torus or other primitive objects, as we call it in geometry. But the intent here is is not to confuse. It's actually to highlight, you know, the sort of like tougher outer skin versus the interior of certain features. As the project developed in the 3D model, this is an example of a project that Ty Foos and I de designed extensively in-house. So this is the model that we were developing. It's bringing in the building model, the base building model, the Revit file from that, the 3D building information model, bring that in. We're designing the climbing walls, coordinating it with, in this case, it was vertical solutions, but Ty and I had ideas. And so here's what we're working on. And in this image, you can see that this is an example of one of those panels I was talking about, and I'll show you how it works. So if that's the panel we're breaking down, 
we there's ways that we can make it so that each of these panels is actually flat. And so you'll see that throughout this facility here, 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 here. This project was executed after I left Brooklyn Boulders and I don't believe they were actually built this way, but the purpose of this exercise in the early design phase is saying that yes, it actually can be done because there's a lot of building examples out there that do it. And this is actually one project that shows that. This is uh, uh, the museum in Tel Aviv, Museum of Art. This was done by a professor of mine actually who um, taught what was called descriptive geometry. And so this is something I've been really sort of studying actually for a while. And in this case, it's a four-sided shape and each of these panels is flat. And I know that there was actually quite a bit of work that went into this because I know the people who worked on it. But the point is, is that this is something that we deal with on a building scale quite frequently. And because the problem of flatness with building materials, meaning most things come flat as sheets or whatever, and you know, yes, you can get things that are curving, but it often gets way more expensive. So what can we do with materials that are sort of cheaper? And anybody who listens to me will hear that kind of you know, effort pretty consistently. Like what is the most we can do with the least amount of money. So in the case of the bouldering project though, so this uh, sort of model, kind of rough, but you know, pretty figured out. Uh, just a rendering, you know, thinking about some image references, this is fully loaded in Waco tanks. And you know, this is some of the things that we were thinking about is the relationship of the building, meaning this building slab to the climbing wall. You know, how do these things meet up? You know, what happens? What do we do at the gap? Where does the window go so that you can see as much as possible? All these different things. And then how do we deal with a slab versus a cave? And then, you know, columns that are basically coming down in between different areas. Um, there's actually a lot of coordination that's necessary to be able to create you know, a top tier facility that is actually really, you know, working with the architecture, not just against it. And so these are just some more sketches. And then these are just a couple quick images of the final product. And you can see here that, you know, the surfacing was handled a little bit differently because, you know, the different manufacturers for climbing walls have different abilities, have different preferences, have different ways of doing things. And so this is before it got painted uh, by the bouldering project. And, you know, but here's a couple of different things we were looking at. And, you know, Ty and I were thinking about these as sort of icebergs with these very prominent features, but also very flat features. And what I mean by that is, you know, these sort of like wedges that are sticking out that have transitions that are, are curving surfaces, not all curving, not all flat, but a bit of a mix uh, of both. And so you can kind of see that in some of these images where on the right here, there's a curving surface that is transitioning between larger flat surfaces. And in this case, um, you know, this actually is creating a bit of a, of a sort of a visual confusion because there actually is a break here. And so this is one of those things where, and I remember Ty telling me this, that when he walked in, he said, it's almost like, um, like a trick because you're, it's not clear actually from certain angles, what's going on there. And that's one of those things that we weren't necessarily trying to do, but it ended up being sort of an interesting feature. And you can see again here, the, there's different sort of curving surfaces that are then accented with flat surfaces. And that I would say over the years has sort of become my, my preference and seems to work well with root setters as I talk to them, because it gives a little bit of both. It gives some of that, you know, intrigue with sort of curving things and people might like that. And then a lot of setters really prefer flat things and I totally get it. So, you know, a bit of a combination here and just a couple more images. And you can see in this case, how there's some things that are sort of bulging, some that are more flat. And, you know, the final result are these, basically these icebergs. But back to the Climbing World Championships. So I thought it was super cool how they did call out all of these different angles and different features. You know, it's it's very interesting to me just how they're how they're breaking it up and how the coloring is working. You know, when you look at the front view, you can see it a little bit more clearly. So what I was talking about with the coloration is, you know, things like this, like that wedge there, you know, this line here, this line here. These are not following any breaks in the geometry. And if we hop back and forth, you can see that. 
where you know the the top edge here is but this bottom edge is not and part of the reason you can tell that is because this giant circle is spanning this whole panel it's not crossing this line because that's where the angle is broken but you know it it's creating a little bit of i mean i don't you know the thing is i don't really know what it's creating is it it seems to be sort of confusing but it also isn't necessarily for the same intent or purpose as the dazzle dazzle painting so you know that's one of the reasons why you know i i look at things that way is that i just like to have sort of at least some reason for doing things one of the things that i saw that i really liked was also the use of these uh 3d models that are scanned and so you know when they go into uh, breaking down women's boulder number one, you know, they go from the sort of uh, overlay image to the, you know, the sort of 3D scan of the wall to zooming in on the problem itself, moving around it in a 3D environment and really being able to show you, you know, what these handholds look like. And when we get to the root climbing wall, you'll see, uh, I think, how effective this is. And, you know, I know just watching this, I thought this was all really cool because they zoom in and you can really sort of see what's going on, which is a lot harder to tell from a view like this. And yes, they have different cameras and whatnot, but even still, you know, when I saw this technology at the Climbing Wall Association conference a few years ago, you know, I, I was talking with the folks doing it. I'm not sure if this is them or not, but it seemed really interesting. And for this type of purpose, I totally get it. One of the other things that I just wanted to talk about was the, the venue itself. You know, this venue, it's pretty awesome. It's got a ton of natural light, these sort of wood glue lamb beams. And, you know, this is just another good example of, you know, a, a very cool building that helps the climbing shine, you know, both the architecture and the climbing. And so, you know, this is an example. Uh, so this is Imori. This is an example of one of those vertical lines that are, sorry, not vertical lines, but sloping lines that's going through the volume. And the reason is because it's not actually changing geometry. It's just, you know, the volume goes across it because it's actually flat. Whether that's doing anything, you know, it's, it's sort of debatable. There's other views that you can see actually uh, this view. You can see, you know, there's, there's probably an idea of, you know, this sort of parallelogram being created with this being the only actual break in geometry, you know, fine. Um, I, I just, I guess I just wonder what it's actually doing other than, you know, sort of creating a little bit of difference. But I, again, I, I just always think if we take a little bit more time to look, there's usually reasons that we can do things a certain way or add depth, uh, add some visual, you know, interest if that's what we're looking for. Uh, in a way that is less, you know, to me, it, I guess the problem is to me, it feels fussy because, you know, in my mind, it's like, does this go here? Does it go over here? Does it go here? You know, like this one, I don't, you know, I just don't really know why anything. And we're, I'm not a rule person um, in terms of design, but I do like to know intent. So intent is the word I usually like to use. Same thing here, um, you know, zooming into the 3D model, looking at the actual uh, you know, wall from the, from the front. One thing that I, I also noticed that I really liked and try to do in most of my projects is the front edge being straight. And then the back edge also is straight, except for this part here that actually bumps forward a little bit. And you can see that in certain pictures from above where you can see the, the seams are cut a little differently. And I'll talk about the padding itself, but the, the padding, the, the cover for the padding is just sort of wrapped around and under, and you can see that on the edge. And again, I'll talk about the pads themselves in a second, but this kind of layout for the flooring, I've always thought is just so great because it creates, you know, clear aisles through a facility or in front of a climbing wall in this case. And why wouldn't you do this all the time? Because foam is expensive and like, because you only need a fall zone that goes out you know, like if we do the fall zones here and I'm just roughing this out, but maybe this is appropriate for the steepest part, meaning this corner or, or even this corner in the back certainly isn't necessary when this is the top of the wall. You know, you could conceivably cut it back. So you are adding extra foam. But from my point of view, I think it's worth it in a lot of cases. And I really like the way this was handled um, with super clean edges, both with the climbing wall back here 
and also with the front of the um, of the boulder there. This is a, just another view where you can see uh, the front edge of the boulder. You can also, in this case, I think see pretty well that there's there's two layers of pad. There's this black layer on the bottom and then this blue layer above. These to me look like drag mats. And so this is a bit of an interesting system where, you know, and I'd have to price it, but buying drag mats that you then effectively, you know, make into a, a consistently smooth surface with the the sort of, in this case, it looks like carpet or felt or whatever it is. You know, that to me is a flooring solution, I think makes a lot of sense. You know, in a gym setting, you know, you could replace these uh, probably more easily because these gigantic pieces of foam that we often get are just very expensive. So whether or not this is the right solution um, in a commercial facility, you know, I think is for me at least is to be determined. But I think in this case, um, in a temporary setup, I think is really smart. So this is another example where you can see that the handholds themselves are crossing this somewhat arbitrary line because this is a flat volume, as are these uh, big round guys here. These are you know crossing the line without actually being bent themselves in any way. Just a last look at the boulder. I mean, I, I just a really nice setup, you know, speed wall with the the um, images in the back. One thing I would was going to point out as well, though, is no T nuts. That's one thing that um, you know, what's missing T nuts, there's no T nuts and that's fine. I've seen this in other IFC, IFSC events. You know, I actually have been talking to some different folks about this, but it makes a lot of sense if this is the way your setting is going to go. It's just that you end up putting a lot of screws into things and these are going to need screws anyway. So arguably do the bolts really help that much? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like I totally get the idea of this. Again, in a commercial setting, it seems like you're going to Swiss cheese your uh, your if you're drilling, uh, you know, several screw holes like this one, you know, there's you can see just a bunch of screws. If you're doing that every time you're setting, you know, I it just has to really chew away at the wall. Maybe it's easier to refinish because of that. That was one thing that crossed my mind was you know, yeah, you might chew it up, but you also, if you were to resurface it, you don't have to deal with, you know, plugging uh, T-nut or bolt holes because you can just really resurface the whole thing. So I don't know, maybe this is the way we go, but for now, you know, it's just something that um, I wanted to point out. And so moving into the rope climbing wall, you know, again, I love the way that they're they're identifying the the angle, you know, 10 degrees to 40 degrees to 15 degrees. You know, this one also has a variety of things going on that are, you know, this whole, this is a sort of a mountain range here. And you can, I'll show it a little more clearly in a second, but these black, you know, color patches, and I, I, I don't even, I don't even want to call them panels because they're not, they're just paint areas, really. You know, it's creating this mountain thing, you know, fine. I, I would... If, if I was doing this, I probably would be starting somewhere else in the sense of trying to create interest or even different geometries that are features to sort of grapple with. And I get it that we want to be able to use these giant volumes, but I do feel like, and maybe this is coming from my perspective specifically as someone who designs climbing walls is, you know, and as an outdoor climber, you know, grappling with features. I mean, that's what, you know, a striking line, a striking feature. I mean, that's, those are the king lines, you know, for the most part. And and this is cool. I think this is good. And this is, I think this is appropriate to be able to set in a very sort of consistent way like this, but having like nothing else on this wall. And you can see that when it rotates around, looking at, uh, there's a different view I'll show you in a second from the side, but you know, so this is the women's route they're going to show here, um, working its way up, you know, again, you can see no, no T nut holes. Um, you've got these sort of covers for the quick draws, these, you know, dual text mystery holds, you know, but these gigantic volumes with screw ons and jibs and, you know, all of these holes are the panels themselves. And again, I think in this setting, if this is the way you want to be going, it, it does make a lot of sense to be doing things this way. But, you know, as you start looking at those black patches, you know, it you can see the sort of mountain range here, and this is that. But then you can also see all these black volumes, 
you know, it does create some confusion, but I don't think it actually is creating confusion that like means anything or really matters uh, very much. And, and you can see it in this image as well, you know, so it's, it's like a naked wall without holds on it. Um, maybe it has more pop or something, but, you know, again, I, I just, for me, and even when I was watching it live, I just felt like I was a bit confused by it. And I didn't honestly even realize they were a sort of mountain range until looking at images like this after the fact. And so this is the men's route. This is the side profile. And again, you can see just how flat it is. You know, one thing I love is I love it when they put in uh, some cracks or just for some basic hand jamming. I mean, you know, watching 515 climbers, V15 boulders, you know, struggle with a five, nine hand jam or something like that always kind of cracks me up. Um, but you know, it, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever it, it's, I don't know. Again, I, th I found the root setting to be very entertaining. Again, you know, there, there's actually a volume even here. You can't even see this volume, you know, it's sort of within this larger panel of black, uh, paint, you know, there's no angle change here. It's just flat. Again, none of this is wrong. There's no wrong in any of this. Uh, it's all style and preference. You can see some of the same things I'm talking about here. You know, when you get a little closer to it and you don't see that this is the peak of a mountain up here, you know, this doesn't really make any sense. It's like this diamondy thing or these things, you know, is it helping anything? Maybe, I mean, this, this volume is sort of aligned with the bottom edge of it. Okay. Um, but is it doing anything more than that? I, I don't know. And then, you know, the, the, again, the setup, I just thought was, was really great. You know, they, they did a great job of making it a real, like turning an arena into a climbing arena. And so just congratulations to all the competitors. I watched it with my, uh, little girls. They love rooting for, uh, the, the USA women. And, you know, I growing up with in Boulder, spending a lot of time in Boulder when I went to college. And then after when I was designing climbing walls, I got to know a good number of these people and even their parents, which is, you know, dates me a little bit. But um, so congratulations to just all of the people. And I'm really excited actually to be watching, uh, you know, the, the lead in difficulty, sorry, lead in bouldering uh, combination events. I think those I was surprised how much I liked that in the Olympics. But um, and also the para climbing, which I'm actually really keen to watch. So thank you very much for watching. If you find this interesting, uh, please like and subscribe. And you'll also see links down below to uh, how to get a hold of me or how to talk about your climbing gym project, because that's what I do. I help people build world class gyms, uh, really just putting it together, the building, the climbing walls, the whole thing. That's what I do. You want a climbing gym? That's what we work on. So not just the climbing walls, not just the building. It's like the dream is to be a gym owner not a business model maker, right? Like we need to make a climbing gym and all of those are little pieces along the way. So thank you very much for watching. I appreciate your time. Thank you again.